Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another fun-filled, um, informative, interesting um, Elmer night. The uh, I was kind of expecting Tyler to be on, and I haven't. I, I'm not seeing him here yet, so he's probably running just a little bit late. <laughs> I think that's actually kind of obvious. The uh, so. Uh, this is this is the Elmer night, and uh, uh, Tyler has made uh, had some discussions with <clears throat> Bruce Olney, WSY7N, who is an avid summits on the air enthusiast, and uh, uh, and thought it'd be kind of interesting for uh, for um, Bruce to give us some insight into this whole program, what it is, how it works, uh, anything else that he'd like to tell us. Tyler, I see you're there. Um, yeah. Here ahead. I am. Yep. Go ahead. All right. Well, and, uh, sorry. Go ahead, Roland. You're in charge. It's all your. Oh, I'm in charge. All right. Well, we'd like to welcome you all out to our Elmer night. Um, I'm excited. Um, soda is one of the things I've wanted to get into since I started uh, in ham radio, and. Uh, I always felt it would be awesome if I could just find somebody to walk me up my first mountain and show me how it works. And uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, Bruce has to say tonight. And uh, just a sneak preview, uh, we have tentatively planned on the 17th of April to, uh, if we can get permission anyway, to climb South Mountain and uh, activate that summit. It actually has never been activated before, so we'll be the first ones activating it. Um, as a practical exercise for Bruce's presentation tonight. So uh, put that date on your calendar if you're interested in climbing mountains. If not, you can sit in your shack and listen for us and uh, you can get chaser points. But uh, that's all I got to say. Bruce, we're gonna turn the time over to you. All right, thanks, Tyler. I'm actually kind of a newbie at Soda. Um, like Tyler, I was you know, something I thought I'd try sometime. And I just barely got started last June. So I haven't been doing this for even a full year yet. So anyway, I do have some slides. Let's, I think what I want to do is try to rip through these slides fairly quickly. Um, I don't want to discourage interruptions. If you just can't wait to ask a question, go ahead and interrupt me because I don't want to be that much of a stickler. I mean, it'll, it'll mean a lot more to you if we pause and answer your question, if you've got a really burning question. Otherwise, I'm going to try to go through these slides fairly fast without really hosing you down with a fire hose, too bad. And, but I have no idea how long it's going to take, uh, but I, I'm not going to, I'll try not to yap too much. And, and then we should have plenty of time for questions afterwards. So um, let me share my screen and we'll start going through my slides if there aren't any questions so far. All right, let me um, share my screen. So here is my first slide. We can pretty much just skip this one. But I discovered this meme. I don't know if you're like me, but I don't understand memes. My, my kids think it's funny that I don't get them. And I think it's just because I don't spend a lot of time um, looking at them. But this meme intended to be funny, but it's uh, a soda activator. You know, this first frame is what my friends think I do. Non-hams, you think I'm just talking on walkie talkies. Hikers think I'm fishing. In fact, I um, have an interesting story about that, but I'll hold it. Uh, what chasers think I do, I don't completely get this one because I do a little bit of chasing myself. It took me a while to get going on chasing. I'll tell a little bit about that in a minute. Some hams think I'm this huge mountaineer that soda must be something really crazy. Um, you know, you need special gear and, you know, mountain climb, mountaineering gear. Um, this second to the last, what I think I do, and I 
I'll mention that in Utah, this really is what it feels like to do soda. I've got a photograph. I should have brought it, put it in my slide deck. On field day last June, I was on um, Black Crook Peak down south of Vernon. And I have a photo that looks almost exactly like this, only it's my knee. And it's, of course, the view from Black Crook Peak. That was a nice activation. And then the last one, what I really do, I think in the UK, they have a lot of summits where it looks like this, where you're fogged in, you can't even tell you're on a summit, but it still qualifies as a summit. So um, great meme. It's one that I understood when I first saw it. I love to share it with my kids. I said, look, a meme about what I do in summits on the air. Okay, next slide. Let me tell you about me a little bit. I was licensed in 1978. Here in, I was living here in Grantsville. It was, I was a code only novice and I was um, you know, limited to 100 watts and I had a lot of fun as a novice just doing CW. I remember my first QSO on CW, how nervous I was. And it was a very memorable experience. And if you haven't done code, um, I highly recommend it just for the fun factor and the feeling of achievement. Um, I like QRP. Uh, I bought it a, a long time ago. I bought a 10 tech Argonaut 509, five watts only. And I worked the world on that with that, you know, five watts. I really like contests. I especially like field day. First time I did field day, that was, that was awesome. Uh, in 20, so now this brings me up to, well, let me talk about field day just a little bit longer. Um, I would have periods. I got busy. I got married. I had a career. I, I was 14 years old when I got my license in 1978. I, a lot of times, the only ham radio activities that I would do in the year is I would go do a field day. You know, I call it an activation now, it would be a field day activation. Um, but that, that once a year wasn't enough. Um, I started doing other contests field day style. And I really liked 7, 7QP back a year ago, coming up in May. It'll be a year ago in May. This is now my soda history, how I got into it. Um, the COVID was just hitting, but I'd already decided that I was, so 7QP is the seven call area QSO party. And that's where all of the United States wants to talk to counties in the seven call area. And I decided I would go activate two counties for this contest. I, and I went up, uh, I did Daggett County on the Wyoming border and Sweetwater County in Wyoming. And I had both of those. So it was basically a field day style contest, set up a station there. And I didn't really know much. This is the first time I'd been in 7QP. And I ended up taking fourth place in, for the expedition class. And just kind of as an aside, I'm doing it again in May, but this time I'm going down uh, by Bicknell down in Southern Utah. I'm gonna activate three counties all at once. I'll be in Garfield County, Paiute County, and um, Wayne County. Those three very rare counties for Utah, I'll activate all those. And I'm gonna to try to take first place uh, for the expedition class in 7QP. So it, it's fun, but I had fun. And I decided, you know, that was so much fun that I'm going to do end of May is the CQ um, WPX. It's the prefix contest. Some of you may be contesters. I don't know. You know, maybe we can chat about that during questions afterwards. But I, I decided to give a really strong effort. I set up over by Wendover near Volcano Peak. There was this great place where I put up a couple like 700 foot long wires <laughs> between kind of, it was really rugged. But I also wanted to run SO2R. And so I contacted Elecraft and asked Elecraft if they would lend me 
a radio. I didn't really care what, but what they decided they wanted to send me was a KX2. And I don't know if you're familiar with the KX2. I have, I'll show one to you in a second. Um, it's a little tiny radio about this big. They call it something that you could actually carry like a walkie talkie, but it's, it looks more, anyway, well, I got that and used it for that contest. And I totally got that this was intended for that summits on the air thing. And it got me thinking about summits on the air. I had to send the KX2 back. Um, but that kind of planted the seed as like, you know, this is, this is for summits on the air. I've never tried that. I should give it a try. And let me show you what I started um, summits on the air with. I thought I'd give it a try. And a long time ago, several years ago, I had built, this is a KD1JV in Altoids tin. It is a little synthesized radio. It um, does five watts. It has these tiny modules to change bands. I think this is a 40 meter module right here. So I put this module in and it'll do 40 meters. And it has seven other modules. I think I only have three right now. I've got a 20, I have a 20 meters and an 80 meters module. The other, I haven't finished building them yet, but really nifty rig. Um, it's an AST3B and it was designed for this Appalachian or ATS, it's the Appalachian Trail Sprint um, radio. There was some kind of contest. I didn't care, I just thought it was cool. And I had to build this myself. It's actually surface mount technology. And I, in my work, I worked with surface mount, so I wasn't afraid of building, you know, a surface mount radio. Um, but anyway, I used this radio and you can actually uh, power it with a nine volt battery and you get about two watts out. And I actually worked New Zealand on a soda activation with this radio with a nine volt battery, that was a real kick. Um, I was on a summit down by uh, Eureka, not Eureka. It's just south of, of Stockton. Um, anyway, uh, I'll look that up later. I used this and for my antenna, I had, because I do field day a lot, I, hang on, I'm gonna, do a little adjustment on my screen here so I can see what I look like on the, on the air. So I had, this is one of these 33 foot fiberglass jackite poles. It weighs about eight pounds. Um, you'll see I've got some tape on here. This pole went, this is what I used for my first activation or two. I don't use this anymore, um, but this one has been on I took this because my normal pole was broken. I had to go revert to this and this went with me to Flat Top Mountain there west, southwest of Tooele. Um, you can see I've dinged it up on the rocks a little bit. I don't know if you, that'll show in the video or not, but so that's what I started my activation with because I actually had all of this in my shack. Um, it was so much fun, I was hooked. So that's my uh, soda story. And we'll, towards the end of my slide deck, I'll get my pack that I use when I do an activation and we'll go through what's in my pack. But before I go there, some of you might be lost. So let me do a little bit of review about summits on the air. Let me, next slide. So a little bit of a glossary. In summits on the air, you have activators. And primarily that's what my interest was. You climb a summit and you, you activate the summit. Uh, you, the rules are to activate a summit is you actually have to carry your gear to the summit. It might just be from the car away, you know, two steps away to the summit. So we talked about we might do uh, South Mountain East, and that's where our the is it the our two meter repeater I think is located on those towers there. 
if they can give us a key to the gate, I think we can drive completely to the top. I don't think there will be any hiking required to activate that summit. The rule is though, you can't have anything attached to your car. You can't power it from your car. If you want to use a big car battery, you can, but you have to move, carry the car battery outside the car. It can't be touching the car. Um, there are a few summits like that that you can drive right to the top in Utah, but not very many. <laughs> Most of them are, are hikers. Now there are chasers. So the when you activate a summit, you need people chasers who are in their shack at home that try to contact you. And then each of us chasers and activators earn points. You're working toward an achievement award. It's not inherently competitive. Uh, they like to say it's kind of a play on words that we're not on a level playing field. Uh, in Utah, we have a plethora of summits to activate. So, uh, but some place like Nebraska might not have as many as we do, so, or Kansas or Florida. So, anyway, once you achieve, you get points. Activators earn points by activating that summit. You activate. You can activate one summit and get points for it once a year. If you, you can go back and do it again, but you don't get any more points for uh, activating that summit until the next calendar year. Uh, chasers can get points for chasing a summit or contacting an activator once a day. And basically you uh, accrue points and eventually you can earn some awards. The, the main award that an activator will seek would be Mountain Goat once you hit a thousand points. And the chasers, you're working towards your slack, your slack sloth, shack sloth. It was easy for me to say, right? I got it next, missed up there. Uh, there are a couple other awards. awards. Some activators, once that usually it's once they've earned their Mountain Goat award, they then start working on Activator Unique or Soda Complete. Oh, actually most of them do Summit to Summit. It's another award that you can work to where you actually talk to other activators that are on other summits. So that's a Summit to Summit contact. These are, there's several awards and I'm interested in Soda Complete. Soda Complete is you've both activated a summit and you've chased that summit. And there's, there's a role of honor and, and there's, you can check to see how you're doing with other, compared to other people. So, all right, let me move to my next slide. A little history, soda started in England in 2002. And there are now 109 associations actually I stole this, this information. A lot of my slide deck came from uh, Mike AC0PR down in St. George. And I, I shamelessly stole a lot of these bullet points from him. And there may be more than 109 associations now. And Utah, the association, the summits on the air association is designated as W7U. W for United States, seven for the seven call area, U for Utah. We have in Utah 31 regions, and I think it's our counties, all of our counties. And there are 1,577 summits in Utah. Tooele County has 80, I think 83 or 87 summits. Um, I do kind of have an unofficial goal. I'm starting to, I kind of want to do all the summits in Tooele County, activate them all before I die. Some of them might be impossible, so this might be a hard goal. For example, there's a summit in uh, Dugway Proving Grounds. I'll probably have to get permission from them to go activate that summit. Uh, one of them I want to activate is South Mountain East, so maybe in, in April on April 17th we'll be able to I'll be able to activate that one. Uh, so, a couple example of examples of summit references: Deseret Peak is W7U slash NU025, and NU is Northern Utah. Just south of 
Deseret Peak is a sister peak, Medina Peak, and that's W7U slash TO-002. So it's actually the second highest peak in Tooele County is that Medina Peak. Incidentally, TO-001 is clear over on the Nevada border near Ibapaw, and that's the tallest peak in Tooele County. Um, South Mountain East, where we want to go on April 17th, is TO-058. And then um, the points that are assigned for a particular summit are determined by just the altitude of the peak. As you can see here, if it's higher than 10,500 feet, it's worth 10 points. Deseret Peak, I think, is 10,600 and some change to give you the idea. So next slide. There is, in fact, here is a map. This is a, I, a screenshot of the sodamaps.org website. All the map, all the summit, the summits on the air summits, official summits are mapped everywhere in the world. You can go to this website and see where all the summits are. Uh, can you see my mouse moving on my screen share? I'm, I'm seeing no, all right. Well, you can if you can look on this map, I can't point to it then because I don't have a pointer, but you can see the TO, you can find Tooele and Grantsville and you can see, find those peaks. You can see Deseret Peak and out off the west, but I'll let you, let me just move on, but this is, we'll talk about this website again in a second. Next slide, so. Speaking of websites, here are there's here's some links, and I will publish this slide deck. I'll give it to Tyler so that he can email it to everyone, and you can get to all of these links yourself. The main Soda website. Um, let me pause a second. You really you have to have internet access to really participate fully in summits on the air, and it makes it so much easier. I don't know why you would want to without doing this but the main website lots of resources there and then don't miss reading through the frequently asked questions this soda watch three i think i'm going to bring that one up right now let me click the link and you're not going to be able to see this because i have a 4k monitor and it's i basically a huge tv that i'm using as my computer monitor let me change my share to look at this um, at this website. Is that a little easier to see? I assume that it is. Basically, this is live. These are the live spots of all the summits that are active right this moment. In fact, you just saw one just popped up. Well, it, actually, it is live now. K7 or KJ7 RTO just activated W7W, that's in Washington, W7W is Washington, WH191, and he's on 146.52 FM. We probably can't reach that from here. <laughs> um, but there's this, basically this is how the chasers find you you when i'm up when you're up on a summit you're activating a summit you can if you have internet access you place a spot you know, there's a way that you can add a spot if you see this add spot button and that will tell everyone where you are and just incidentally it's a rush because you're suddenly dx um i that was the first thing that surprised me when I was on a summit, I placed my spot. It took a minute or two for the spot to get online and for people to notice. And then I had a pile up on me. I probably had 10 stations calling me at once. I, it was like I was on a de-expedition. <laughs> it's a rush. And so anyway, this is the spot. This, this website is really neat. Let's what happens when you click on this link? I can find out about this summit. I click on it and 
this gives me information about this summit. It's worth two points. Bring this over here. So, so it's worth two points. Um, if I want to, I can click see this summit on Google Maps, which isn't super interesting. Um, but the soda maps is interesting. That's the website that I showed you of, of Tooele County. Takes me right to that summit. This is where this guy is. There in Washington, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit more. Yeah, he's up there by Vancouver. So this is a, I use this mostly when I'm chasing and when I'm activating, I use, I've closed my, let me hang on a second. Let me bring this back up. So I use this website when I'm activating to post spots so the chasers can find me. And if I'm chasing, I use this, I kind of leave this on, it will give you an audio. You can configure it to say, to give you an audio um, alert when there's a new spot on there. And I go look, is that someone that I think I can reach and give it a try. So, all right, well, let me switch back to my screen. My share back and let's talk about some more of these websites. Soda Reflector, um, it's kind of like uh, people get on there and, and it's kind of like Facebook or the, where you, it's kind of a social networking. You can get to this, that forum was up on the, on the window I was looking at. I already talked about soda maps. You can do some research on a summit. How do you want to get there? You can shop. You do have to pay for your awards if you want to. They have some really nice awards. They look like a little block of ice when you get your mountain goat. It costs like 20 bucks if you actually want one. In my case, I'm not sure if I'll get one. It's just the fact that I achieved it is good enough for me. And these are web resources for learning how to do summits on the air. I highly recommend getting on YouTube. I think I learned a lot just from YouTube. I really like Steve. WG0AT, and yes, that's his vanity call sign. He actually has pack goats, and he has goats sometimes carry some of his equipment for his activations. And it's, of course, he's, he's been a long time mountain goat. He earned his mountain goat a long time ago. He's, I remember the first time he worked me, I was on an activation. I'd seen all of his, a lot of his videos. I haven't seen them all. Um, I, I was almost finished. My pileup was dwindling down. And one of the last callers to call me was, I was copying down, I was in, on CW, I had copied down some of his call letters and I got a W and then a G and then a zero. And I, I felt like, you know, paparazzi, I, celebrity Steve, <laughs> WG0AT worked me. I even sent him an email. I told him I felt like that, you know, it, it was fun. And all of these guys are approachable. Um, this last one, Mike, AC0PR, he, he was the second Utah mountain goat to get his mountain goat award. And he was kind of my Elmer. I, I, I actually contacted him, got on qrz.com QRZ and found, found his email address and sent him some emails. And I asked him for help, you know, what do you recommend? How do I do this? And, um, and I, I've asked questions to Steve WG0AT as well. So, and Adam, he just has really cool videos and he does crazy things. He activated a summit during the ARRL 10 meter contest in December and actually brought a, a Yagi, a 10 meter Yagi on top of a summit and build it there on, he's crazy. Um, but I like his videos. So you'll have the slide deck, you can go, I recommend you go check those out. All right, this next slide, this is where I was yesterday. This summit, you can see back behind my, you know, over my right shoulder there, 
is a summit in, it's the grass, grassy mountain high point. If you go on I-80 towards Wendover, about halfway across, there is a rest area. Actually, it's, it's the military area, actually. Um, but this, you know, the rest area on grassy, on I-80, that mountain range to the north of that um, rest area, it's the grassy mountain range. This is the highest peak in, in that mountain range. And so anyway, this was me yesterday uh, about, well, it's probably about 2 p.m. maybe that I was, when this picture was taken. Here's another view of that summit. Um, it was about a, not quite a one mile hike and the elevation gain from where I parked my Jeep, I actually had to go down a little bit and, and then climb back up. Overall, I think it was about eight or 900 feet of elevation gain to get to it. It was actually a bigger hike than I was expecting. I still haven't learned to read topo maps and to get a feel for how hard that peak is going to be. I mentioned Black Crook Peak uh, during field day in June last year. Uh, I thought that was going to be an easy hike. It was like 1.3 miles. It was a pretty heavy elevation change. It was almost 2,000 feet elevation change, I think. But I, I, I wasn't in super good hiking shape. And uh, that hike in there, activate the summit and back out, took me 10 hours to just go 1.3 miles. That was a really hard hike. I'm probably never going to do that one again, <laughs> Black Crook Peak. So anyway, this was yesterday. Here's a view not quite all the way from the top. In fact, I was about almost, you can see those black rocks towards the top. I, you're seeing some of those black rocks in this picture. But I'd never seen this view of the Great Salt Lake from this side. I've, I've this is some of the things that are so awesome about activating a summit is the view that you get. And now let's see, I'm getting, I think that's the end of my slide deck. Let me talk about this summit a little bit more. I need to see, so I, and then I'm gonna show you what's in my pack and then open it up for questions. Actually, I'm not, I'm just gonna show you what's in my pack. Let me stop sharing my screen. So then if you can make my, you might want to make it check, set your view to speaker view so that you see me, my image big. So let me show you what was in my pack yesterday because I haven't unpacked yet today. This is my pack. It's my winter pack. Um, I got to explain what this is to start off with. Um, I actually am using a green screen here and my fishing pole. I have a like a 21 foot fishing pole. It's a crappy pole, crappy pole, however you say it. And it's green, so it shows up as invisible on from my green screen. Um, so that's the first thing you see. Uh, it ex it's much lighter than that jackite pole that I that I use. Um, I haven't ever weighed it, but I think it's like 10 ounces at the most. It's probably not even that much. Uh, and it works, works pretty well. This, I'm gonna kind of, un, un, this is my winter pack, like I said, so it's a little bit heavier than my summer. This is just a pad to sit on. If you're, it's much more comfortable than sitting on snow or a cold rock. Um, I. For my winter pack, but even my summer pack, I'll always have like a hoodie, an extra one. I, I used this when I was on the summit because it was breezy up there and a little bit cool. Put this on, that's all I needed. I, and of course, oh, this is green too. <laughs> this is actually a uh, beanie, you know, just a, you know, a ski hat. Here, now I have no head. <laughs> I think that's cute. Fun with a green screen. Uh, let's see. So let's, what else is in here? I usually, I'm always needing rope because what I basically, how I do is I'll lash this pole 
um, to something, a bush or a tree, or sometimes I'll just pile rocks on it. But then I'll use twine like this to kind of make a tripod to support the, uh, the mast. Um, let's unpack everything. I really like this REI pack. I have it bungeed here to the bottom. Yeah, actually, I'll probably just leave this on here. Well, let's let me unbungee it. So, so this just pops off. Let's get inside the pack. Um, like I said, it's a winter pack, so I have ski gloves. Didn't need those yesterday. It was warm enough. Here is my antenna. And it's, again, this is green, but it's green plastic. You get these winders. This is actually a kite winder. And I, I get this kite winder. You buy these from, uh, there's a website. I'll put it, I'll add this, add that website. I think it's DX. They have a lot of ham radio stuff, but you can get them from there. Um, my co this is actually a linked dipole. What that means is, is I've got these little links. Um, I have a link for 20 meters. So if I disconnect this, this wire, then it's in, the, it, it's a 20 meter dipole. If I reconnect it, it 40 meter dipole. So this antenna is resonant with no You're tuner. <laughs> Um, does someone have a question or? Okay, you're good. Just someone. So basically, this is this is this winder. I have two of these winders on here. I probably should do a video on how to make one of these, maybe, and I'll post it on YouTube. Send you a link. RG one seventy four coax. It's uh, HF frequencies that the loss is negligible. I didn't say that right. And the other co coax, you know, like RG58 or RG8 is way heavy. Um, I'll talk about that antenna if you have more questions or maybe on another night. Uh, my heavy winter coat is in here. I didn't need that yesterday. Uh, this bag is just snacks and emergency snacks. And that's, and plenty of water. Bring more water than you think you'll need. Make sure you have a lot more back in the car. Finally, let's get to what you're probably more interested in. The station. I showed you the antenna, but I have a clipboard. This is the battery I use. It's a it's 11.7 volt uh, lithium polymer rechargeable. Um, and then I use here is my log, which I still need to enter my log. I just do it in pencil. Let me put that down for a second, and finally. I'm now using, I actually purchased an Elecraft KX2. I have it packed in this custom foam that I made myself. But here is a Elecraft KX2. Um, I really like this radio. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. It's perfect for Summit. Incidentally, yesterday, the first person I talked to was I noticed a station in California on 20, uh, 40 meters single sideband. I used the built-in microphone and worked him on sideband. That was my first QSO. And then I got a summit to summit. He was, he was on a summit in California and I got a summit to summit point for that. And that's, I'm really interested in summit to summit. Well, let's see, there's some more. Let me show you some more things in my Question pack. Question for you, Bruce. Sure, go ahead. Um, how many watts do you try to um, push 
when you're doing when you're trying to connect summit to summit and i guess how many watts do you usually push with that um radio okay the kx2 can only do 10 watts and when i'm working somebody on sideband i've learned from my qrp experience that five watts on sideband is not very much so i kick it up to 10 watts for sideband and I try to remember to go back down to five because I'm still a QRP enthusiast and you have to be under five watts for QRP. Um, so yeah, I usually run five watts. And incidentally for my seven QP attempt down in Southern Utah in a couple of weeks, you know, May, first weekend in May, I will be running five watts even on sideband because I'm, I just, I like QRP. I like the bragging and, it, and it's fun. So that answer your question good enough? Yeah, yeah, I did. Thank you. Okay. Um, incidentally, five watts on CW is plenty. It works great. Um, I just, yesterday, just kind of as an aside, I was running 10 watts CW because I for, forgot to turn the power back down from working sideband. All right, I'm actually getting close to being done with my entire presentation. Uh, in my pack, I have some more emergency supplies. If I get stuck there on the mountain, I can start a fire. Um, I log with a pencil. Um, although Steve WG0AT, just as an aside, he actually records his QSOs with audio and then logs when he gets back home. I, I've tried that once, but I discovered that I'm... I have the habit of uh, sending CW, I have to read it. So I write down their call sign. And then when I call them back, I have the habit that I've got a break where I have to read it to send it. I can't remember in my mind and send the call sign. Uh, let's see, what else is in here that's interesting? I have spare headphones. If you haven't, headphones is an amazing improvement for me for copying. It's like having a, a beam, it really improves things. So, and this is a spare pair in case I forget my main pair. And the key I'm currently using is this, I happened to buy a long time ago, this uh, Palm Radio Micro key. Um, so it just basically I plug this in. These KX2s, they come with, a paddles you can put right here. I'm gonna get one of those eventually because that'd be more convenient. I'm tired of these cables. Uh, let's see if there's anything else in here. This isn't my main log, but if I forgot other paper, I have spare paper, emergency snacks, M&Ms. I'm not getting paid by from Mars to do that. And spare battery. Okay, I think and I have a spare pencil. I think that's about it. So for my presentation that I have prepared, um, let's fire away with questions. Let's cover some of your questions. Tell me what. The Sorry, Bruce, clear. Bruce, this is Roland. A, a lot, an awful lot of our members only have a technician class license. And uh, how, how does the uh, summits on the air work for folks who are, who are limited to uh, BHF and up? Okay, um, good question. We, I wished that I had Mike Cartmill here, uh, w, or AC0PR down in St. George. As I, I, I'm kind of have stopped paying attention, do, well, all right. Let's assume, I'm assuming what you mean is, is they only want to do VHF, two meter FM, is kind of, is implied um, by your question. For most of them, that's all the capability they have. Now, it used to be that the technician class had novice privileges, which is CW yeah, they, only. Yeah, they still do. The, still do? Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but most of, you know, most of our technicians have a VHF or UHF uh, radio. Okay, well, the logistics with just your VHF radio are um, you need if to activate a summit and to get points for activating the summit, you need to um, have at least four QSOs, four contacts. 
So you are at the mercy of the chasers. Um, it's pretty hard. You, you'd pot, you kind of need to have your buddies. I actually don't, I have brought a, like a handy talkie with me and they work really well. It's just drumming up people. You can get on repeaters. You like, you could get on a repeater, even the Salt Lake repeaters and you explain who you are. This isn't my mode. I'm kind of, I, I don't do it this way, but I'm, this is how it would have to work if I was doing that. Um, and you have to do the QSO has to be through simplex. So you'd have to go find somebody to come and chase you on five, two or whatever simplex. Um, yeah, not impossible. I, I understand that 146.52 is a fairly popular summits on the air frequency. Mm -hmm. It is. And I do hear, I've only carried a handy talkie with me maybe on three activations. And that was because I was wanting to, I did do a summit to summit with W7GA. That's um, Greg Allen. And he's, I first met him because I was on Bountiful Peak. And it was, again, I was on Bountiful Peak. That was another awesome activation. I, uh, I set up and I, I don't know if any of, well, let's not make it too long of a story. I, I, was, I activated Bountiful Peak one evening and I was working people in New Zealand and Japan. And when I, I didn't tell you about the, the, uh, the spots, the, the soda watch, they actually have a RBN, a reverse beacon network if you're doing CW they have computerized receivers all over the world that will skim your CW signal and then they will post it automatically put a spot if you're a CW operator on soda watch and it set, shows who the where the receiver was that spotted you so on that day sunspot minimum the RBN receiver that picked me up was in Finland and I was working people all over the United States and New Zealand and Japan. But the contact that I enjoyed the most was I was almost done in a very weak signal. I copied W7GA and he told me that he was in Utah. And it was, and I actually recognized him because I'm, he's been coming out here to Tooele County and activating some of these Twilla County peaks and I was getting jealous. I was like, hey, you beat me to that one. I wanted to be the one to activate that one. But anyway, the you know, one time I carried, I carried a handy talkie with me because, because he was on an, another summit. I think he was close. To, anyway, he was on one summit and I was on another and I wanted to talk to him. And I did hear some 5-2 activity, just as long as you can find four stations to work you. And it is okay to get to find somebody on a repeater and say, hey, I'm on, a, I'm on a summit. Can you switch over to simplex and see if we can make a QSO? Um, that's the way it would, you would do it as a technician. But I highly recommend to build yourself a little CW radio, or if you've got, if you, if you can afford it, you know, I, per, to me, it's not that expensive. You can, this was about $800 for this one. Um, and get on the novice bands and do it from CW. You'll be amazed and it's worth it. It's hard. I remember learning CW, <laughs> but everyone's patient. Um, it'll be, you'll have a hard time drumming up some two meter contacts and you'll, it'll be a nail biter to get your four. But yesterday I worked, I probably worked, oh, at least 30 or 40 stations all over the US. I expected, because it was in the afternoon, I expected that there's a guy, a ZL, uh, I think ZL1BYZ, John in New Zealand. If I'm on the afternoon, if the conditions are there, he usually works me, uh, chases me. Uh, but 20 meters was kind of dead yesterday afternoon. So I think that's why he missed me. So I, I encourage you, learn CW and, get on your and novice band CW, you'll be, you'll be really impressed. So. Hi Bruce, um, yeah. Tyler. 
Um, I, I do have a question, but I want to make a comment first. Is I've I've worked one day. I was just monitoring uh, one four six five two on my little Baofeng, and worked some guy that was activating up above Bountiful. I don't know if it was Bountiful Peak, but he actually activated two summits that day, and I, I worked him on each summit because I caught him later on the day. Um, but anyway, so I was that was my little Baofeng, and I, the first time I was at Great Salt Lake, we were walking around the beach there by Salt Air. And the second time was right in Grantsville as we were on our way home. And he was on the peaks above Bountiful. I don't know what he was using. I didn't ask him what his rig was, but my Baofeng was making the trip, um, you know. So yeah, it, it, it's possible. You're right, you probably need some pre-trip publicity <laughs> to do it on 14652, but, but yeah, it's possible. Well, you um, know, there are some chasers in, in like uh, WB7ULD. He's like the number one chaser in Utah. He's, he's like, he's, he's got, he's, anyway, he'll probably, if he sees your spot for on 142, you know, 144.52 or whatever the frequency is, he'll probably come and chase you yeah. even on VHF. Just awesome. Yeah. Um, so my question was, how much does your backpack weigh fully loaded? winter i'm guessing is heavier than summer but what's what's the weight range i think uh last time i weighed my winter pack i was like 12 pounds wow is That's... all and in summertime i'm less than that so mm -hmm. i keep it really light uh, and wow. i i carry a lot of stuff that i think some people would say ah oh, you don't need that like i probably have more water i have extra coats but i usually am grateful for the coat you get up you get up on the summit even in the summertime i've quite often was really glad that i brought my hoodie i always bring my hoodie right anyway uh, cool. another question one more question i'm sorry i interrupted oh, no no keep them keep them going have you ever done an overnight um hike to the top and camp overnight or, I, or are you just a daytime hiker i'm just a daytime hiker but i almost did it overnight uh, on accident. <laughs> um, I have a pretty gnarly Jeep. Um, I, my son, that was also part of my motivation. And my son got into rock crawling and you see a, my background, the red rocks, Southern Utah somewhere. I don't know where this is. It, it's a stock photo I got off online, but, um, so I can get really close to the top of a summit sometimes that because of my Jeep, but you know, it's got a lift and rock sliders and lockers. And so I got a crazy Jeep, um, but I got, I did Bountiful Peak down by Provo and it's a nasty hike. It's like three or 4,000 feet um, elevation change. But I saw a little road and I took my Jeep and cut off, a, you know, a thousand feet of that. And when I got to Bountiful Peak, when I got up on top of, not Bountiful Peak, uh, Provo Peak, I said Bountiful Peak. When I got on top of Provo Peak, there's another peak that's just a mile and a half to the east. <laughs> I'm right there. And it was an easy hike. So I decided to hike over to that other peak. And that hike was rough. It was a really rough hike. And I... It was, the sun was going down as I activated that summit. And then I hiked back and it got dark on me. And there was this little, this little ridge of rock. And I, it was a cliff on both sides. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there was one point where I was kind of stuck. And I'm like, oh my gosh, am I going to be stuck here all night? So anyway, no, I'm a daytime hiker personally. Um, that does sound interesting, though. There are a couple summits in the UNAs that to get to is probably going to need an overnight hike to get there. So that awesome. sounds interesting. I liked backpacking. I may, I may cool. do one of those one day. <laughs> cool. That's all I got. Thanks. You bet. Anybody else have some questions? I'm, I'm open. Okay, question for you. How many of you are interested in activating the summit here on the 17th? So this is the this is the lecture today. Uh, Tyler had the idea of is let's go do, uh, let's have lab and let's go activate a summit. Who wants to go on uh, April? Oh, let me put a, another blip in there. 
that day, I guess last year they had a what they call a summit to summit QSO party. This was being sponsored by the, the soda activators in New Zealand, Australia, and Japan. They did this last year. They want to do it again on April 17th from 2100 Zulu to 2300. It's a two hour period. It's in the afternoon. I think, like, I think someone that's good with converting Zulu, I think that's like uh, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. or something like that. Have to look it up to see. But basically, there will be a lot of activators in New Zealand, Japan. Um, actually, I heard one in Taiwan was saying that he wanted to participate. Um, basically, they're wanting to talk to North American activators. So that'd be, and they will, they will stop. They will, every once in a while, they'll call anybody from North America and, and they'll have all the chasers just do summit to summit. So I bet we can work some, not only DX on that day, but summit to summit DX, which I haven't done before. I did one, I was on Vernon Mountain South um, in January on a Saturday in the afternoon. And I heard a New Zealand station that was on another summit. I, I wasn't able to work him, but I'm excited about that. So anyway, who wants to, who's interested to go? I'm in, <laughs> of course, you know, I'm in. Um, I know Trevor Foss and I, he, he's not on tonight unless he joined us late. Um, he's probably at work, but he's really excited. So uh, you can count at least two of us. All right. If he can get off work. Can you get the key to the gate? That's the question. Well, um, actually, I think I think we can. Uh, I called I called Andy today, Andy Tanner. Uh, after when I knew that that was what you were talking about, and I called Andy uh, Tanner today, and uh, he's you know he feels like uh, we can make it happen. Uh, his big concern is is how dry the road will be when you get up near the top. Well, I'm pretty sure my Jeep can make it. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, I, I think it, what he doesn't want is he doesn't want us tearing up the road. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, the spirit of this is if you if you get you, we should hike a little bit. So if it pull off the road and yeah, you know, I, I it doesn't say like you're supposed to be able to carry your stuff like 300 feet or something like that. Nope, nope, doesn't say that. Okay, nope. cool. It just can't be connected to your car in any okay. way. Well, anyway, Andy, Andy sounded like it was uh, something we could make arrangements to do. Just as long as we take care of the road. Yep. So. Yeah, as long as we don't tear up the road and we leave the place as good as it was when we got there. Awesome. Well, and, and I live in South Rim and I know whose property we have to hike up if hike through if we want to go through the back way. And I'm pretty sure they'll give us permission to hike through if we have to go that route. If we don't get permission to go up the road, and we have to come up the back side. Anyway, I have plan B. Plan A is Roland's plan. <laughs> I'll, I'll handle plan B if that one falls through. The back side is really steep and that's nasty. Yeah, I'm from I'm, I'm, north. No, not from the north. Um, I'm talking, uh, we would come up the saddle between the two summits because there's the east summit and the west summit and there's a saddle between the two. And, and that would be, plan b would be to hike up to that saddle and then turn east and head east up the mountain um it, you're right the, the north slope is pretty steep and nasty but uh the, the heading at it from the center like that shouldn't be too bad i don't think i could be wrong i'm like bruce i don't read topo maps very well but i sit and look at it every day when i look out my front door so <laughs> Uh, now there are a couple of us that uh, probably this is not in our you know it, you know my 76 year old blood probably isn't going to do that very well but I definitely want to chase you know so um, what well, you know I'll be looking for you on CW and maybe two meter FM might as well yeah I think some, you know, a couple of folks that might be able to go up would probably be relegated to two meter FM. The, uh, there's a couple of other folks that aren't able to be here tonight to kind of express some interest. That brings up a question. Did we record this presentation?
But yes, it is being recorded and it will be up on our website probably sometime tomorrow. Okay, sounds good. I, is it possible I can get a copy of the raw footage? For oh, absolutely, you? absolutely. I'll stick it out someplace where you can download it. Sounds good. Uh, well, that's all I have. If you don't have any more questions, um, if you want me to go into more detail, um, I would love there, to build, like there's several QRP radio kits out there. I'd love to build one just to try it out. Um, I, and I probably should just do a video and post it on YouTube. I kind of want to set up a YouTube channel that, kind of uh, my idea for the YouTube channel is to basically instruction for summits on the air, how I do this, how a lot of them will be how to get to the summit or how not to get to it. Like <laughs> Black Rock Peak, this wasn't a good way, but this is how I went. It's got to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, we've got repeaters up on Black Crook and, uh, and Andy always goes up by helicopter. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and you know what? I think the actual summit on the air, Black Crook Peak, is the next one to. I think you're talking about the one that's the next yeah. one. To the yeah, it's just it. there. Yeah, it, it, but nevertheless, either either one of them are not are not a picnic to climb. Oh man, I saw that equipment over on the the summit to the north, and I was like, "How did they get that there? There's no roads. It must have all been brought in by helicopter." Yeah, it's all in, all came in by helicopter. Yeah, so there's a we actually have a repeater on that summit. Yeah, we've got a repeater. Plus, there is so does the uh, uh, so does search and rescue and and the county uh, uh, P twenty five repeaters up there as well. Yeah, and there's also some uh, microwave up there. Mm. All right. Well, Tyler, any last minute? Uh, nothing that I can think of, but I love the the idea of uh, when COVID conditions allow us to meet in person again, you know, having a, another uh, <laughs> Elmer. Holy cow, my brain cramped up and I wanted to say another name. Anyway, another Elmer night with Bruce and uh, building those QRP kits. Yeah, that would be... Yeah. And building a little at building that antenna that would be kind of nice too. Yeah, I think yeah. the antenna could take a, a whole night. Yeah, yeah. We awesome. built some yeah. That's, that's repeater cool. ones at, at one of the Elmer nights a couple years ago. Yeah, that's right. And boy, I'm I'm really looking forward to get you know to uh, probably this fall when we'll be able to meet together instead of having to do everything by way of zoom yeah okay well bruce thank you it has been it has been delightful and uh, already got two or three people telling us that we want to do a presentation on building a qrp radio the uh, okay so let me find myself on this thing here i am Okay. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, your questions, concerns, anything else, uh, feel free to fire them off to us by, by chat, by text message, by email, or whatever. But uh, this uh, video will be up on our uh, YouTube channel sometime tomorrow. Uh, I found it absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Bruce. I really, really appreciate it. Now, just as an aside, Bruce has talked about summits on the air. There are two other kinds of on the air activities that I'm aware of. One of them called islands on the air, and finally parks on the air. And, uh, and I think those are gonna to be topics of discussion coming up as well, because there are several islands and several parks in the, uh, in the state of Utah uh, that can be easily activated, you know, by folks who are not particularly agile at climbing mountains. The, uh, Okay, thank you all. Anybody have any last minute comments? Speak up now. Just thanks for having me. All right, well, you're very welcome. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, cheerio gang. Have a good evening, 73. 73, good night. <laughs>